So could you um, talk a little bit about, maybe I'm skipping over too much, but um, Brigham is close to death, and he has John Nuttall, is that what you're saying? Yeah, Nuttall, his secretary, yeah. So he has his secretary, Nuttall, uh, transcribe the temple ceremony, and it sounds like when Brigham spends time with Nuttall to have this transcribed, Brigham's got a lot of power to decide what goes in and how this is how this plays out. And then talk, please, a little bit about um, well, just that and then the, the integration of Adam God. Okay, the, the basic outline of the temple ritual we know is there in, a, in 1845 because we have exposés of people that leave Mormonism in 45 and 46 that tell about their going through the temple. So we have the basic idea of what Joseph put in place and, and how the Mormons were doing it in Nauvoo. Uh, but we don't have a full text. But we do have a skeleton outline of how things were done and some of the things that were said. Um, and then you have all these people like Brigham Young and the early leaders that would have gone through this with Joseph. So you have a collective memory here of the ceremony when they come to Utah. Plus, if they wanted to use them, there were some exposés that they could refer to to refresh their <laughs> minds. Uh, but besides their own experience to try to formulate a ceremony. So when they get out here to Utah, uh, Brigham uh, puts, puts this together in a, in a more polished form than maybe they had it in Nauvoo. Uh, he obviously added someone added elements that weren't there in Joseph's day because one thing they put in was an oath of vengeance against the United States that uh, the Mormons took a vow to always pray that God would take vengeance or, or see justice done to those that had killed Joseph Smith. And uh, when the Reed Smoot he hearings happened in 1904. This was one of the points of controversy in the hearing was did the Mormons take an oath of vengeance in the temple to kill anyone they met that had a part of Joseph Smith's death? And uh, so the, the question is just what was the wording and how specific was it? Does it? Did it really mean that you were supposed to kill anyone that had a part in it or was it just that you would, were praying that God would kill the person that had a part of it? It, it does trigger for me the question of just how relevant the temple ceremony was indirectly to the Mount Menace Massacre. Um, yes, because the Mormons had sworn an oath of vengeance against those who had a part of Joseph's death, or against the, uh, the prophet's deaths, if you want to make it in, into a broader category than just Joseph Smith, because you had more than Joseph killed. I mean, it was Probably his brother uh, Hiram that was killed at the jail, so you had two uh, prophets or leaders of the church right there. You also had Parley Pratt, an apostle that was killed in Arkansas in uh, 50, 1857. And so if you had already taken an oath in the temple to avenge the blood of the prophets, and here you've now had three prophets who have been killed by the United States people, you could see how this would build in a person's mind an, a feeling of obligation when a group from Arkansas comes on a trip moving to California through with this huge wagon train, uh, that some would feel they were doing God's service by taking vengeance on this group of people from Arkansas where Parley Pratt had been murdered. So yes, I think there's a tie-in on the loyalty oath. It's one of many factors, but I think it is one of the factors that plays in to the Mountain Metal Massacre. So read some uh, Reed Smoot was a Mormon apostle who was elected to be a senator, and there was a big Senate hearing, and it took a couple of years, and they interviewed church leaders, the president of the church, everybody trying to figure out if the Mormons were still practicing polygamy, did they still have an oath of vengeance, what all was done in the temple ceremony, and so they questioned everybody on the stands. And, and when this became ballyhooed in all the newspapers and all, that seems to be when the church got rid of the oath of vengeance out of the ceremony. So Reed Smoot, um, Reed, we, were, we were at Reed Smoot, and these, these hearings <clears throat> seem to have had a, a significant impact on the Mormon temple ceremony content itself. Do you think uh, this triggered uh, perhaps a change in 
the elimination of the verbalizing of the, 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 the penalties? Uh, yeah, the, you will find from oh, 1900 on, it's hard to get dates on when everything has changed because unless you have the Mormon records of when everyone wrote everything down, you can't pin down dates for changes. But it seems like at the turn of the century then that there was a move to um, tone down things in the ceremony and to modify it. And certainly Reed Smoot's situation seemed to have been a time of, uh, um, of modifying this all because of public scrutiny, because of public exposés, uh, a lot more coming out and being talked in the newspapers. And so things started to be toned down in uh, some of the verbiage of the temple ritual. Uh, and the, the blood oaths were not as gory as they used to be, where they, before that time, I think, were more graphic and talking about the tongue being ripped from the mouth and that. And it became much more that, uh, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I, you know you, uh, the sign of the penalty was the slitting of the throat and that, but, there, but it wasn't as graphic in the description of it. And that over the years, we see that become more and more tame in how they deal with it. And then finally in 1990, they quit doing the signs of the penalty completely. But it went from an oath of, if I reveal this, I will have my life taken, and these are the signs of the penalties, to rather than reveal these things, I would suffer my life to be taken, and these are the signs of the penalty. To us today, they don't do the signs or anything, but you still take an oath of secrecy not to tell the ceremony. So before the smoot smoot hearings, um, <coughs> A couple decades before that, when Young dies and he has Nuttall, Nuttall uh, transcribe the temple ceremony and give it some standardization. From what I've read, he, he had Adam God as a part of the lecture at the Vale right. at the St. George Temple Ceremony. And there seems to have been a transition from then until about the time of Smoot where there was confusion over whether Adam God... I mean, what, is that the kind of thing that we're supposed to believe in private but not talk about in public, just like polygamy or...? Yes, that, that was... Um, a Mormon today would, probably wouldn't even know what we're talking about when we talk about a lecture of the veil, because they don't even have one now. That was uh, taken out, I think, in... Uh, I don't remember if that was... It was after 1990, but I'm not sure just which date, but, uh, but they don't do a lecture at the veil now at all but what was it uh the lecture on the veil was kind of a recap of what you'd been through so far of the handshakes and passwords and uh the oaths and covenants you made kind of just retelling it all to you in case you got lost through the whole thing and you couldn't keep it all together in your mind it was this abbreviated summary of what that was all about and the oaths and covenants you took and the handshakes and passwords and stuff and so then with Brigham Young, he puts in to the lecture on the veil this doctrine of Adam God, that uh, he is our heavenly father and the father of our spirits, and uh, that he originally came from some other planet, some other world system, and there were gods before him. And this was all part of that lecture on the veil that was at the St. George Temple, remembering that the Salt Lake Temple hasn't been finished yet. And so at that point in 1877, uh, the St. George Temple's the place where you would be going to, wow. that's why you have the lecture at St. George and not at Salt Lake is because it hasn't been finished yet. And so they're doing it at St. George Temple. And so you have this institutionalizing of this doctrine. Now Brigham Young had been teaching Adam God for uh, two decades before this. It's not like this was a brand new thing when he puts it in the lecture. It's just that it's the first time, now you see it being formalized into, in a sense, almost making it like scripture to put it in the temple ritual. Before that, it's in <coughs> sermons. And so he might get up in the conference and talk about Adam is our only God, and the only God we have to do, and he's the God we pray to, and our Heavenly Father, the Father of Jesus. And he gives all these sermons for years. But now he's institutionalizing it. But this was a bone of contention within the 12 on, especially with Orson Pratt, on this idea of uh, uh, Adam as God 
Orson and Brigham conflicted on a couple different points. The idea of did God continue to learn? Uh, how is he changing? Uh, has he reached all perfection or is he still progressing? And so the Mormon Church today kind of has followed along with Orson Pratt, which I think is pretty funny. Um, <laughs> because here's the prophet arguing with Pratt, who's just an apostle. And Pratt won. And Pat, Pratt essentially won. And so that uh, the church today would say, uh, God did achieve all knowledge. And what, and he, what he does do progress, Pratt. what he progresses in now is power. Right. So that it's, uh, he becomes a more powerful God as more and more of his creation under him becomes God's. He is overseeing a greater posterity so that it makes him a more powerful God, but not that he's progressing in knowledge, that he, already, he knows everything. Uh, but that whole concept, um, it, it's a totally different concept than a Christian view of God where God has always known everything always, and the Mormon God has to acquire this knowledge, acquire this experience, and grow in understanding uh, until he reaches this pinnacle so of you, godhood. If you hear Adam God at the lecture on the veil in St. George, <clears throat> and uh, Brigham dies, and they seem to jettison Adam God, and then with Wilford Woodruff and Joseph F. Smith, they start changing their tune. They say, well, that was never taught, it was misinterpreted. Um, it, seems, it seems like it would uh, be an understandable cause for the, the roots of the seeds of Mormon fundamentalism, among other things. Right. So what you have then is for, after Brigham's death, you have essentially maybe the next 35 years of people left sort of in limbo that heard Adam God and not knowing now whether they're supposed to still believe it or not. And so some people that may have always had some doubts about it are relieved and, and they quit talking about it. And others that still believe it put it in their journals or something, but they may not say as much about it publicly. And so some of them evidently start thinking, well, it's a true doctrine, but the world's not ready for it yet. <laughs> so th this idea that the world isn't ready for this greater truth and so they it's kind of put on the back burners and not talked about and I've talked to people of my grandma's generation who say yes after the for, turn of the for early 1900s it was not it would not have been uncommon to have heard Adam God from somebody in your ward or in a sermon in your ward or something. The old guys. In the stuff, old yeah. people that had, the generation before that, that had grown up uh, hearing Adam God. And so it took time for it to start dying out. Uh, but when the Mormons were giving up polygamy in 1890 and starting to uh, make accommodations to the world, there were some Mormons that were very troubled that the church seemed to be accommodating with the world and giving up essential parts of Mormonism. And so you, have, so you start getting a resistance of some people feeling we've got to hang on to the old guard, the old teachings. And so you have the seeds then of the fundamentalist polygamous movements from the old guard who say we need to hang on to Adam God, we need to hang on to Adam uh, being our Heavenly Father, and we need to hang on to the old rituals uh, even like we haven't even talked about Brigham Young's blood atonement idea that there's certain sins you can commit your own blood has to be shed for like if you violate your covenant of uh, marriage and commit adultery maybe have your throat slit or something and so you have this old guard that say hey we're, we're giving polygamy we got to practice polygamy for godhood so how can we get that up and so behind the scenes you start getting the formation of old line Mormons that really believe Mormonism. They're 100% Mormon. It's not that they're trying to apostatize from the church. They feel the church is apostatizing from them. They're, they're purists. They're purists, and they say, we got to hang on to the old stuff. And so uh, after the turn of the century, there are, well, okay, let me back up. After the manifesto, the church was sending... <coughs> people to Mexico to be married in plural marriage 
and you could get a certain certificate from one of the apostles here in town, take it to Mexico, and down at the Mexico colony of Mormons, they'd marry you in polygamy. And so you have this subculture of some people still living the old principles, and this becomes the founding people for the fundamentalist movement that had been a part of this behind the scenes carrying on of Brigham Young's old Mormonism. And as the church comes into the next century and is trying to become accepted as normal and regular in the United States, the church is trying to distance itself from its past to not look funny, not look like a cult, look like regular America. And so as this gap widens, you have this other group that are trying to hold on to old Mormonism and that becomes the start of the fundamentalist people. Now the problem with the fundamentalist movement is you start having bickering over who has the true authority to authorize these plural marriages. Because they were distinguishing priesthood authority and the institutional church. Yeah, the priesthood was separate from the church and that there were supposedly <laughs> John Taylor, uh, president after Brigham Young, John Taylor, who's before the manifesto, 1890, you get the manifesto of Wilfred Woodruff, but the president before Woodruff is John Taylor. And he gave a revelation that was never canonized, saying that polygamy would never be done away with. So those that held to old line Mormonism knew about this revelation. They say, hey, no, we were never to give it up. Woodruff either was fallen or it was just a ruse to buy time with the government whatever, but that's not the way it's supposed to be, and we're still supposed to stick with the old way. Uh, now, also, uh, supposedly, Taylor set aside and ordained a certain group of men with priesthood power to continue on with polygamy outside of the institutional church. So of these men that supposedly Taylor set aside to carry on polygamy, then you start to get factions of who has the leadership and the power to do these ceremonies. And from that, you get these divisions off of the different polygamous groups. And today, who knows how many there are, 30 to 50,000 people involved in polygamy in different groups, each claiming different priesthood authority from different guys uh, in this maze of trying to trace authority back to John Taylor. So let's, let's fast forward to, I think, the 80s. Um, and there's this rabble rouser. 80s in which century? 1980s. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so we've got the Tanners. Yeah. Um, we've also got this really important, I mean, no matter what one's opinion of it is, it was very pivotal for everything here, uh, a movie, The Godmakers by Ed Decker. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure some other things you can think of that really brought the Mormon temple ceremony mm -hmm. it, to, to light, the public light. Right. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Right. Um, okay, well, there had been exposés of the temple ceremony done at different times. Like I said, back in the um, 45, for, uh, 1845, 1846, there were some. There was an exposé done in the 1880s. Uh, there was an exposé done in 1931. Uh, when we put out our temple ritual account of the uh, 1969 ceremony in our Mormon Kingdom book, um, then we put that ceremony out again and when we did our big book, Mormonism. So there were accounts in print, but they had small distribution. I mean, there, there hadn't been wholesale reading of these, just Mormon community, small, you know, numbers. Uh, but then in the early 80s, when uh, the Godmakers came out, uh, uh, and uh, there was a reenactment of part of the temple ritual. It, the, um, the movie uh, sparked this big media attention to Mormonism and discussion of the rituals. And there were a couple of different former Mormons that had been through the ritual that were going around talking, giving demonstrations, showing the clothing and things. And so I brought this out into an open discussion. Um, and it really caught fire so that the Godmakers book and the Godmakers movie had this huge distribution uh, and made a public awareness of the Mormon secret ritual. And um, 
that the ritual had parts in it that would be embarrassing and off-putting to the uh, to the public because in the temple ritual uh, in the play of Adam and Eve and the devil coming out to tempt him, in the old ceremony they had the devil make a deal with a minister who was in a clerical collar and clerical outfit um, to represent all paid clergy and it would have looked like an Anglican priest or something with that kind of you know white collar thing and the devil makes a deal with him for money for pay to preach false doctrine now in the early 1900s they used to say an amount of money that the minister would be paid by the devil to teach false doctrine well as the years went by and the economy kept rising it made him look like a fool to work for that little and so they upped his salary a couple of times and then finally they just took it clear out of, of, and didn't mention a salary and then the devil would just say i will pay you well if you will teach my doctrines but to, just to be clear here mormonism at this time is mocking that's Protestant. mocking yes traditional Christianity yes, absolutely. within its own sacred temple That's ceremony. Right. And if, if anyone outside of Mormonism said, hey, can I talk about the part of the ceremony where you mock my pastor, a Mormon, would say, no, that never that, happened. That's too sacred to talk well, about? Well, in the old days, the Mormons would have said it's too sacred to talk about. But in today's world, if a Mormon would talk to you about those things, they'd say, that, that isn't in there. I just went through last Thursday and there was nothing, there was no minister in there, there was nothing like that in there. You're lying. Or the people that told you that were lying. And that would be true for the experience they had today, but it's not true of the experience people had before 1990. So as mentioned earlier, in 18, 19, 1989, marketing surveys put out by the LDS Church, the members are asked what put, is off-putting. Yeah. What was changed in 1990? In 1990... Oh, by the way, tell the story <laughs> of how you learned about this, because this was so dramatic, right? Uh, yeah, well, okay, they had had April conference, and it was uh, a couple of days later, and uh, a few days later, I guess. Uh, this fellow comes into the bookstore for some other reason. I think he was delivering something. And uh, I just I, I did I used to do this a lot with just different Mormons just to see if I got any information and I'd say oh has anything exciting been happening in Zion lately and uh, any sacred secrets that I shouldn't know about you know <laughs> and I was just kidding with the guy and he says well actually there was something that might be of interest to you he says uh, I was just talking to a friend of mine and uh, he went through the temple. <clears throat> the day or two after conference, and he says they've changed the ceremony. I said, you're kidding. And he said, no, no. He says they, have, they give a little statement at the start of the ceremony now that would, at that time, that said <clears throat> uh, something to the fact that uh, when you go through this, it, it'll be a little different than what you've been through before, but not to worry. The brethren are in charge. We know all this, and everything's cool. So that's good. See, but you didn't get told what. It's just... It's all, it's all cool, guys, you know. And uh, so then when you went through it, they took out the penalty also, the slitting the throat and the bowels and all that. Uh, they took out the embrace on the five points of fellowship at the veil, which was taken for masonry, but it used to be when you went up to meet God at the veil and give him the handshakes and passwords, you would have embraced on what they termed the five points of fellowship, which would have been foot to foot, knee to knee, shoulder to shoulder, hand to back, and you whisper in the guy's ear, and it would have been an intimate kind of hug. Uh, <clears throat> and I think that was objected to by a lot of females because a male plays a part of God, and they get in this kind of huggy embrace. It was kind of awkward for some of them. And so they took that out, and there was a number of, of refining of words in that. Uh, one of the elements that Joseph Smith took from masonry was the five points of fellowship. And this, in the Mormon temple ritual, was kind of like the climax of the ceremony. So as you go through these handshakes, passwords, the switching of the robe to one side or the other, at the end of the um, presentation by Peter, James, and John and these different witnesses in the prayer circle and all that, then uh, one by one you come up to a curtain at the front of the room and before 1990, when you went up, uh, the man on the other side playing the part of God, you would have embraced 
on what they term the five points of fellowship, which are directly from masonry. It's a very kind of structured hug. Yes. So it's uh, inside of foot to inside of foot, knee to knee. So your right foot is put forward and his right foot's put forward and your knee to knee with his right leg. And then it's hand to back. And uh, you're going to be shaking hands with the right hand. And so it's shoulder to shoulder and mouth to ear. And so it's, it's the point being there's five points at which the body is to touch. Five points of fellowship embrace. And then you say this phrase, health in the navel, marrow in the bone, strength in the loins and sinews, and blessings on my posterity for all generations to come, whatever it is. And this little ditty you say. Okay, that was the climax of the ceremony. And at that point, the curtain would be parted and you would symbolically walk through this curtain to go into the celestial kingdom representing you had entered into God's presence. Okay, because some people had evidently been uncomfortable with this embrace, you can imagine a woman, depending on how big the man was, that this could be a very uncomfortable kind of embrace where you got the inside of the knee to knee thing. And so anyways, in 1990, they took the embrace on the five points of fellowship out. Well, this was pivotal to the ceremony. If God revealed this ceremony to Joseph Smith, this is what you're supposed to go through and do to come back to his presence. They're, they're taking out the penalties. They're taking out the embrace on the five points of fellowship. Uh, they are... Uh, the mockery of the Protestant the minister. Mod the minister's been taken out. They modified the woman's oath of obedience to her husband to where now it's an oath of obedience to God and to follow her husband as he follows God. It's, it's a little bit, I mean, she's still to follow his direction, but it's modified. It was much stronger oath of obedience to her husband. Uh, so they modified this, the different wording in the temple ritual to make it a kinder, gentler ceremony. Well, if this was from God, why wasn't it that way the first time Joseph Smith gave it? Uh, in Joseph Smith's day, it wouldn't have been more acceptable to have a full tub washed down in oil and uh, the uh, embrace and the slitting the throat and all this. So it shows, to me, it shows an accommodation to the world. They're trying to make this less of a shock to a new convert, less offensive. Um, when the Godmakers came out and exposed that they were mocking the Christians with the minister in the temple ritual teaching false doctrine, uh, that he was taking pay to teach the gospel, <coughs> uh, all of these elements become more and more embarrassing to the Mormons as more outsiders know what they're doing. So in 1990, they make this major modification of the temple ritual to where it's more palatable, especially to new converts coming in. There, there's not the same resistance to, oh my word, what is this ceremony that I'm going through? So that, uh, and that's done in 1990. Well, so today you can meet the probably half the Mormons that would not recognize a discussion of these points because it's never been in your, their experience. And that's, oh, you must be lying. It was never like that. But if you get a Mormon in the temple before 1990 and ask him, is this what you did? He'll have to say yes. And there's actual ta tape recordings that were done at the time. A tape recording by a member was done in 1984 and one was done in 1990. We know what the ceremonies were at those times. And so you, you've gone through and listened to those, I assume. I have and listened to those, yes. Corroborated them with transcripts. Right, right. I have talked with many people that have gone through hundreds of times through the ritual and who have verified for me that those transcripts are correct. So there's no doubt in my mind that we have the actual ceremonies as they've done them in those different points of time. And as we already mentioned, oh, by the way, uh, the 1990 changes it shook some people up, right? Because yeah. this is supposed to be an original pattern given by God, but it's being disrupted with institutional direction. Some people left the church over this. Some people did. However, a lot of people were so relieved when the changes happened, they wouldn't let themselves even think about the implications <laughs> of why they were relieved that the change happened. So in 2005, there's the washing and anointing. Then in 2005, they make more adjustments. 
up to that point at the beginning of the ritual when you have gone in for your washing and anointing before 2005 the first time you took out your endowments you would go into the cubicle take all your clothes off put the sheet over you and you had nothing on underneath it's like getting an x-ray and then you would go into this cubicle where two people of the same sex as you would ceremonially uh, one would dip their finger in water and touch the various parts of your body underneath the sheet to bless you that you could uh, think clear thoughts speak the word of truth uh, nurture your children and your groin area. You could multiply and replenish the earth and your feet that they could walk in the ways of truth. And, you know, so they say these prayers. And then they would do, uh, do it with oil and they'd dip their finger in oil and they would anoint the different parts of your body with a prayer. So in 2005, instead of doing it that way, they said from now on, the first time you come to the temple, we'll have you put on the Mormon temple garment, the undergarment first yourself in your cubicle then put on this over sheet, then go out to the room for your blessing. And the person then would just touch their finger in water to your forehead and say the prayer blessings of that. Then touch their finger to the oil and touch your forehead for the blessings of that. So that it eliminated the whole anointing of the body. But there, I mean, when you think of Joseph Smith's day, when this was a full washing in a tub, and an oiling of the body, right. it is this progressive moving away from this to this just ceremonial touching, it shows an accommodation to the world to me. Uh, I mean, I, I'm glad they don't do it that way anymore. However, if it's an ordained experience that God laid down... Who cares what you think then? Yeah, right. I mean, that's like the Mormons argue against those that would sprinkle for baptism instead of doing full immersion that, well, that's a concession to the world, you know, that the real thing is to have a full immersion baptism. Well, then wouldn't the original temple ceremony be the same way? I mean, haven't they made an accommodation there uh, like they object to going to sprinkling? Why aren't they objecting to anyone modifying the temple ritual? But the polygamists do. And so you have the polygamous fundamentalist Mormons who would argue that this is another example of how the Mormon church has gone into a state of apostasy because they've changed the temple ritual. And they've got a good argument for that. They have a good argument. And the temple garment was originally down to the wrist, down to the ankle, up around the neck. And the Mormons have gradually shortened the sleeves, made a two-piece, shortened the it's up above the knees now, and they, they've made it lower in the neck. And so the polygamous Mormons wear the old-fashioned garment. Now, some polygamists don't, but some polygamists wear long johns, the old-fashioned Mormon garment that's a full-length one. And uh, the, the, some of the groups don't do their own temple ritual, but some of the groups that do have a temple ritual still wear the old, long temple garment because they think that the church today is just conceded to the world. So when the original temple ceremonies were revealed, the original layout of the temple, the the clothing, the iconography, the symbolism. It sounds like something implicit, uh, it sounds like it was implicit that Freemasonry tapped into a, an original Solomon's Temple kind of uh, that was the idea. set of uh, ri rituals and, that, and that it had been corrupted and Smith was going to take these Masonic rituals. So anyway, it sounds like from the get-go, Mormonism is implying that it is restoring what was practiced in Solomon's temple. Yes, I think the average Mormon would assume that and would agree to that. So the implications of that are, are um, ceilings, endowment, mm -hmm. uh, and washings and anointings. Yes. For general people. Yes. For, for all the Israelites. Right. We're done in the temple during the time of Solomon's temple. Yes, but most Mormons haven't stopped to think that through. But on the surface, if you ask them, is the ceremony the same as done in Solomon's temple, a Mormon would say yes. But they haven't usually stopped and really thought through, oh, that would mean all the Israelites would have had gone through that. How do you reconcile that with just the uh, Levites be the ones going in the temple? And they usually haven't really thought that one through. So, but is it safe to say that Mormons generally speaking, because of the impression that the institution gives. Yes. They're not speaking of the temple as a 
fresh revelations started in the 19th century. No. They're not thinking of, with the exception of baptism for the dead, they're not thinking of <clears throat> the things done in there as freshly revealed as a starting point in the first century. This is thousands of years ago yeah. under Israelite practice. Right. Anyway. That's the way they would assume it to be, yes. That is, that is amazing. Wow. Uh, and I think about the, the lampstand and the altar of burnt incense and the table of showbread and the Ark yeah. of the Covenant and the altar of, you know, of just... The incense and everything. Yes, yeah. I mean, the Mormon temple has, does not have the layout that any Bible dictionary or commentary would give you of what the Jewish temple was laid out to be. You read the Old Testament where it lays out the temple ceremony and it tells you what the furniture was, uh, how the rooms were constructed, uh, who got to go in which rooms, and uh, it's all very structured and written down. God didn't have a problem... <laughs> God didn't have a problem with all the Israelites knowing what happened in the temple ritual, so I don't understand why... They celebrated it. Yeah, why, why should a Mormon today be upset about talking about the temple ritual today if in Moses' day everyone could know about it and talk about it? Granted, there were just certain ones that got to go in it, but everyone could know what happened. They wrote it down. Why don't the Mormons write theirs down and let everybody read it? Um, it's a little of fun side point here um, and a little history behind it if you could tell about uh, if, if it's on, in your mind uh, somebody claimed to have snuck in the Salt Lake Temple mm -hmm. said they were going to publish images and to preempt that the church publishes images of, of the Salt Lake Temple and there are these little things in the temple that you can spot called spittoons right well at um, oh what would it have been right after 1900 sometime in that time frame. Uh, uh, someone did actually take some photos inside and uh, the church realized they might be published. And so they hurried and did their own photos and put them out. And so like I have a book now called, uh, I think it's House of the Lord, that has photos from the temple from I think around the 1905 something like that time frame, 1912, I don't remember the exact year, but something in that time frame of photos inside the temple. And in some of the rooms, you will see a little white uh, spittoon in the corner by the door or in the corner by the side of a chair. It isn't just once. I mean, there's several of these in different pictures where you can see a spittoon <coughs> in the corner of the building. What's a spittoon? A spittoon is when a man is chewing tobacco and he gets all that juice in his mouth, he's got to spit it out into something. And so back in the 1900s, when people chewed tobacco, they had to have a little spit bowl somewhere around to put that in. And so there would have been in the temple these different spittoons. But so, they're, they're clearly in the photos. So a Mormon could say, that's nuts because that would have been a violation of the word of wisdom. And violators of the word of wisdom obviously are not allowed in the temple. Well, uh, up until the turn of the 19th century, they were still having, the apostles were still using wine in communion in the temple. So the word of wisdom wasn't that set in stone until it was after. A commandment. It wasn't treated as a commandment. No, it wasn't. It was words of wisdom. And uh, so the, um, the fact that some still smoked or chewed uh, was a common thing to run into. Uh, there's, there's, I think Brigham Young has, uh, I think Brigham Young has a, a couple of sermons in the Journal of Discourses where he talks about the women complaining about the guys spitting in the tabernacle and spit being on the floor and the women's dresses dragging in it, you know, and you've got to quit doing that, guys, you know, so. <coughs> It was evidently a common practice of the day for people to, men, to be using spittoons and chewing tobacco. <laughs> so the, the way the word of wisdom was interpreted and its enforcement as part of the Temple Recommend interview, it's gone through a wild evolution. Yes. Uh, back at 1900, it would have been a much more just general sort of an interview of, do you support the president of the church as God's prophet and do you... Um, support the brethren and pay your tithe and you know it'd been, been a much shorter kind of an interview okay okay um 
Tell us about temple work as it relates to Mormonism's approach to good works. When uh, Christians talk to Mormons about salvation by grace, a Mormon will very often counter, well, we must couple with grace good works. And the Book of Mormon has a phrase that says, we're saved by grace after all we can do. And so the Mormon interprets this as the two go hand in hand. You can't just have grace, you must have good works as well. And um, so then the question becomes, what are we meaning by good works? And when they say this to a Christian, uh, we're saved by grace after all we can do, or it's grace plus works or whatever, the Christian is usually thinking good works like feeding the poor, um, taking up collections for the Salvation Army, or you know something that way. Loving your neighbor. Loving your neighbor, taking pie over to the next door neighbor that's sick, or you know something that way. Uh, while the Mormons would encourage that, that's not the good works they really mean, because the good works you really have to do is the temple ritual works, because it wouldn't matter. For a Mormon, they could be a good Mormon, and they could help everyone in the neighborhood that they could, but if they didn't regularly go to the temple, they are not doing the works of God that make them approved. It has to be an, uh, a commitment to a faithful participation in the temple ritual. Now, that doesn't mean they have to go every week, but you know it has to be some sort of regular basis, maybe a few times a year or something, but there has to be some sort of participation there to feel you are in good standing. So when they say faith without works is dead, the good works that count towards eternal life are is especially the, temple works. Is temple works. I mean, it is, no other good works are enough. It must include temple ritual. That is essential in the Mormon mind to have eternal life. And this is where the Mormon doctrine of, of eternal life separates itself from the Christians, all Christians, that they have this ritual that one must regularly participate in to be accepted into the presence of God, that your faith in Christ alone, no matter if you led the most perfect life possible, that faith in Christ alone outside of Mormon temple ritual would not be enough, according to them, for you to have eternal life. They have added to the gospel, and that's a great offense to the atonement of Christ to say that Christ's death on the cross, his personal payment for my sin, was not enough. That beyond that, I'm going to give to God something more than what Christ could have given or fulfilled for me by me going to the temple to do all of this. Especially temple work, because yes. Hebrews says Jesus has entered into the right. Holy of Holies and right. he intercedes for us forever now. Uh, I know one Mormon lady that one of the final things for her in leaving Mormonism was uh, spending time one day studying the book of Hebrews. She, she felt like someone had told her it, if she read the book of Hebrews, it doesn't teach Mormon temple work. And so she made this a matter of prayer to read the book of Hebrews and pray that God would open her eyes to what it really said, whatever it was. I want to see what you really mean here. And as she kept reading the book of Hebrews that day, God showed her she doesn't need the Mormon Melchizedek Aaronic priesthood, because Jesus is the last high priest. The Old Testament was a symbol pointing to Christ when he would be our last high priest, who would offer himself as the last sacrifice in the temple, thus opening the way for man to have acceptance into God's presence. It was through the atonement of Christ, totally. That, that was it. He opened the door and passageway to be right with God. And so for the Mormons to tack on to that, some human ritual that you have to perform time after time is adding to the gospel of Christ. It's saying what Jesus did for you wasn't enough. And so for the Christian, they say, wow, that, that puts you outside of standard Christianity when you do that. Do Mormons hope for communication with the dead in their temple experiences. I have had many Mormons tell me that when they went to the temple, some dead <coughs> family member appeared to them and asked them to do their temple work. Mormons will tell me that in the night, in their dreams, that a Mormon relative will come and ask them to do their temple work. 
It, uh, in the past, there was a book at the Deseret Bookstore on uh, about temple experiences of visits from dead relatives. I mean, this was a common thing in Mormonism. It's not that every Mormon has such a story, but every Mormon probably knows someone that has such a story of an experience with a dead relative who has affirmed the work that they did or asked them to do the work or appeared to them in the temple. Now, some of them may be demonic and some of them may just be a play on imagination. Uh, I think if you've been doing research on genealogy and thinking about your dead relatives, I could see how easy it would be to have a dream and dream about somebody you were doing temple work for and then interpret that as a vision. Uh, the anti-temple, um, I've heard stories of uh, the founding founders of the Constitution uh, yeah. <laughs> visiting uh, Mormon leaders. And right. There's a lot of stories of uh, those kind of experiences. I've had people tell me that when they were in the temple, they were walking down one of the halls, and down at the end of the hall, they saw their aunt or somebody who had been dead for years walk by, and when they got down there, no one was in the hall, and so they knew it was the aunt that had been there to affirm what they were doing or something. And I'm thinking, it just sounds to me like someone walked down the hall, went into another door, and, they, and by the time they got to the end of the hall, the person was just gone. But to them, it's this mystifying experience of, oh, wow, I know the church is true because my brother said he saw Uncle Tom in the temple, and so it must be true. So why, why should Bible-believing Christians see that as something not good? Well, the Bible teaches we aren't to have communication with the dead. We aren't to be seeking out those kind of communications, our communications with Christ, with God, not with... Uh, these kind of uh, experiences. Uh, uh, the Bible clearly says that uh, we're not to seek contact with the dead. I forget where it is in the Old Testament. Um, anyways, <laughs> yeah. uh, so it's going against scripture and seeking this kind of contact. And what would be the point? God has given us everything we need to know about eternal life in the New Testament. Why would we be seeking some sort of contact with a dead person to get more information? Tell us about second anointings. <clears throat> Most Mormons are familiar with the basic idea of the temple ritual of baptism for the dead <clears throat> and the marriage ceremony and the endowment idea uh, and then the sealing for the marriage. But beyond that, there's a ceremony they call the second anointing. The second anointing was instituted by Joseph Smith, and we know this because of different journal entries from Mormons. I mean, they discussed having been given the second anointing. And then uh, now that more of the uh, original Mormon documents and diaries have come out through the years, uh, we have uh, quite a number of different references to people, uh, church, Mormon church leaders, who put in their diaries uh, comments about the second anointing and when brother so-and-so had it or when this person that writes the diary had it. And so we've been able to compound a, comprise a kind of collection of these sorts of experiences. And um, the second anointing is something that's done by invitation only. You don't apply for this. You don't go to your bishop and say, I want my second anointing. The president of the church and the council of 12 would be the ones that would send out a notice through the stake president or somebody that so-and-so is to be called in to tell them that they uh, now are invited to take this new step and have is second anointing. Is this something stake presidents even know about? Uh, I would think most stake presidents would be aware of second anointing. I don't know about in third world countries. I'm not sure how far afield they go with that. Is but this reserved for a very elite? Members? It's a very elite thing. It's so that um, after years of faithful service, where you've established yourself as set in stone of you're going to be a Mormon, so like you've been a mission president, director uh, for several years, and, and a bishop in the past, maybe a stake president in the past, and you've proven yourself to be fully committed to the church then the church may invite you to come in for a second anointing ceremony. And in the second anointing ceremony, the husband and wife come together, and they go into a special room called the Holy of Holies that is not used for any of the regular temple rituals. Is, this, uh, Salt Lake Temple has it. Salt Lake has it. I believe the D.C. Washington, D.C. Temple has it. 
I'm not sure how many temples. There's just a few of them that have a Holy of Holies. And uh, so you go into the Holy of Holies room, and uh, there is a foot washing ceremony between the husband and wife. There's an ordination of the couple to make them kings and priests and seal their anointing on them. When you're married in the regular sealing ceremony, it's with a promise to be uh, kings and priests and gods, whatever, in the hereafter. And, uh, but it's conditional on you staying faithful Mormon. But the second anointing promises you exaltation, which translated Mormon thinking to godhood. You're guaranteed exaltation as long as you don't commit murder. Any other sin can be forgiven, but murder is the only thing that would cancel this. But you have now been sealed that you will have exaltation in the highest level of heaven, which means to become a god. Uh, it's only given to a elect number of people, and it's done to this day. Um, and there's different books like Berger's book, Mysteries of Godliness, that discusses the uh, second anointing ceremony. It, amongst historians, it's a commonly accepted idea. They all know that's part of the Mormon temple ritual, but the average Mormon hasn't heard of it. Is this, uh, is this what's referred to by some as having your calling and election made sure? Yes, you're, yeah, your calling and election has been made sure. You're guaranteed exaltation.